Anin, Muscote piece of cake, caca pica zut, Magama shim sonam, Anishinabe nakwe in a ne, Natiznikas monkey chan, Ki natonche, Aski natonche. The Dinaway Makanak, my relative. Second, second online discussion forum with NCCIE, National Centre for Collaboration in Indigenous Education. You can find our website at nccie.ca. During this online discussion forum, we're going to talk about approaches to teaching math and sciences. I want to thank the IKS uh, Media and Technology for their uh, strict protocols and ensuring their safety during these times. I also want to thank Jennifer Dockstader, our uh, national lead, for the uh, continued work that she does in making sure this project happens. Currently, we are in our third year of this uh, project, and we are just uh, bringing a wrap to what we have been working on over the past uh, year. In the first two years, we went out to communities, Indigenous communities, and we asked them what are Indigenous knowledges that they wanted to ensure that they brought forth that they were shared, that we use an ethical way of sharing the knowledges that were in the community, and we put that forth. After the second year, we started to focus on lesson plans. And during the times that we're facing in this world today, that is a great resource that will be available throughout the summer. As regions, each region is uh, developing and creating their own lesson plans that are connecting to the knowledges that are uh, wanting to be shared by the Indigenous communities that surround that region. As I said earlier, my name is Dustin Brass. I get to teach in the Faculty of Indigenous Education at the First Nations University of Canada. I want all people who are watching this today that if you have people in your life or in your family who are interested in education, that they seek out First Nations University as a wonderful opportunity to get their degree and take these things that we're going to be talking about into further spaces in educational uh, environments. We have three guests with us today, and we will talk to the panelists throughout the show. And then at about the 45 minute mark, we'll go in for a final talk and final words from one of my mentors and guides, Willie Ermine. NCCIE, as I said earlier, is on uh, the, is a website at nccie.ca. If, if you could, you please uh, go to that website over, uh, over the next little bit and start to see the resources that are available throughout this country. Our, we have a couple ways in which you can uh, connect and you can submit questions. Please send your comments and questions throughout the show and we will ensure that we can get to as many as that we can. Also, our direct text line, if you prefer to text, is 306-552-4357. That's 306-552-4357. And we will get to them as many as we can. As you see, I have uh, the cell phone here to, to collect all the texts that, that come in. I will, be, uh, I will be looking at that. You know, math and science is such an interesting topic, and I think about all the ways in which, in our regular, everyday lives that we face and we see and we interact with arts, I mean, with, uh, with uh, math and science. I even thought about the simplistic mathematics of verifying my equation this morning. As I had, as I was getting dressed and I had two socks and two feet, and at the conclusion I had balanced my equation with two and two. I also think about all, all the things that we, even just coming to the studio today, all the things that we encounter that impart in the sciences. But of course I want to carry that all over to the panelists and hear what they have to say and I hope that we can engage in a wonderful discussion that brings apart a lot of knowledge and a lot of sharing. But to know that it doesn't end here today, that this, this has continued to be uh, lived, continued to be utilized within in the societies and, and the places in which you encounter. So our first panelist that I want to go to for the first question is Dr. Edward Doolittle. Ed, Edward Doolittle is a Mohawk from Six Nations in Southern Ontario. He earned his PhD in pure math mathematics at the University of Toronto in 1997 and later studied the Mohawk language for a year in the Ongwan Kintoyakwa immersion program in Six Nations. I apologize for my, my Mohawk pronunciations. 
He has taught mathematics, math education, and Indigenous studies at the University of Toronto, York University, Six Nations Polytech, Queen's University, Confederation College, the Saskatchewan Fe Indian Federated College, and the University of Regina. He is currently an Associate profes Professor of Mathematics at the First Nations University, where his research interests are Indigenous mathematics, including Indigenous statistics and math indigenous mathematic education and pure mathematics. He lives in Regina, Saskatchewan with his wife. He is also the creator of Cree Scrabble and is also one of my wonderful colleagues at the First Nations University of Canada. Good afternoon, Edward. Thank you. It's, uh, it's pronounced Ungwewuna uh, Gunjokwa, which means our language group in Mohawk. Thank you very much for that. For that. So I would like to go to you uh, with the first question and, and uh, as we, uh, as we had mentioned in your introduction, uh, I know you have created the Cree Scrabble. So for those people who are new and familiar to hearing that, um, I, I know it's something we'll talk about later on today in today's panel. But at this moment, um, my first question for you is, um, I, I go back to a, uh, a comment that you had made in, in mathematics, and, and maybe first, could you, could you introduce yourself, Ed, before we, we, we go any further, and any, anything that I've missed? Oh, you gave a good introduction. Uh, I, I just, uh, I'll, I'll just say that I've been interested in Indigenous mathematics uh, for my entire career as a, as a university student. So since I was about 18, I went to the University of Toronto and uh, I became interested in how I can serve my community. So not just about learning uh, pure mathematics, which is my passion, but about how I can apply it to serving Indigenous people. So the first question for the panel uh, is for Dr. Edward Doolittle. What are the challenges in teaching science or, and math from your perspective, from an Indigenous perspective? So what are the challenges in teaching math from an Indigenous perspective? Well, there, there are many challenges. Uh, let me focus on one in particular uh, that I've been spending some time thinking about lately, and that's uh, that uh, uh, there seems to be a disconnect in just a general kind of uh, philosophy of knowledge in indigenous uh, the world, indigenous world, and, and non-indigenous, uh, and, and it has to do with uh, um, the way uh, uh, the two cultures um, see uh, uh, how knowledge is divided up into smaller pieces. So in, in Western culture, we have, uh, we have science, and then among sciences, we have physical sciences, and then among, uh, you know, we also have mathematics and computer science. And, and then mathematics is, ma is subdivided into smaller disciplines. I mean, I, I studied something called analysis, partial differential equations, and so on, when I went to, when I went to uh, university. And, and it just became narrower uh, as I went along until finally my PhD is just about a tiny, tiny little chunk of mathematics. Uh, and so that kind of uh, division, that narrowing, is is the way Western science works. Uh, and indigenous knowledge is very different. It's it's holistic. I think we uh, we all have a uh, a sense of that. And and it's also practical and applied. And so these are some philosophical differences. And and I think we have to find ways to overcome those differences or to um, to cope with them in order for our uh, science education to work better for Indigenous students. Thank you, Ed. I want to acknowledge some of the people that we have uh, tuning in today. I see Julie Moffat from Quebec City, Rachel White from Treaty 3 Territory, uh, Leanne Smith, uh, Kristalovic, um, Bozouv from Treaty 1, um, and, and of course, uh, Twyla Don Marie McWally from uh, uh, Fort Coppell area, the Treaty 4 grounds, and Christine Schoenroth. Hello, it's, it's wonderful for educators uh, to be joining us as well as everyone uh, who uh, is tuned in at this moment. For the next question, I'd like to go to Rockford McKay. Before I go to Rockford, I'd like to introduce you a bit to him. He's a member of the Barrens River First Nation. Rockford has his Bachelor of Science and Bachelor of Education from the University of Manitoba. He's a co-author of the Manitoba Pearson Grade 7 Science Textbook and educational advisor to the Grade 10 McGraw-Hill Science Textbooks used in Manitoba classrooms. He also served as a school trustee for the St. James School Division in Winnipeg. He majored in chemistry and microbiology, but has a lifelong interest in astronomy. He enjoys sharing his knowledge of Ojibwe and Cree stories of the stars. <clears throat> so hello, Rockford McKay. Welcome to the panel today. So my question is the same as I, I had asked Ed. Um, 
what are um, what are uh, for, what are some of the challenges in teaching science from an indigenous perspective? Good afternoon. Yes, happy uh, to be here. Um, there's been uh, a lot of challenges to uh, educating our youth, um, ranging from um, lack of equipment in, in, in our schools. Um, a lot of our teachers are, are not very comfortable with, with teaching science, and I, I think there's a, a lot of reasons for that. Um, although I'm a member of uh, the Barrens River First Nation, oh, can you hear me still? We can hear I you. Uh, I grew up in Winnipeg, and uh, uh, so was educated a bit differently. And uh, I was fortunate to to get a lot of uh, a lot more science in in my in my schooling. Um, just. Uh, Today and you know I was thinking about a lot of the about this and uh, of course we have the uh, the COVID nineteen uh, epidemic now and uh, you know this science education is is uh, thinking about science literacy I think we needed a lot more not not just in, in First Nations but in Canadian society as well so I think as a nation we we struggle with this. Thank you very much for that, Rockford. Um, and it's wonderful to hear that, uh, you know, as an educator myself, I think about how we take what we've learned from our growing up, from our learning of life, and we implement that into our teaching and the, and the way that we educate uh, learners. <clears throat> if, if I can just add as well, um, there is a certainly a different perspective. When, when I thought about this again, um, when, when we think about the, um, the Christian Euro uh, perspective on, on worldview, it's, it's much different than, than, than First Nations. So, for instance, our, our place in, in the universe is, is, is different. And, and, of course, growing up and, and going to uh, Sunday school and stuff like that, I was taught initially that uh, man was, was closest to God. And from there we had, uh, you know, there's God, there's man, there's the animals, plants, and the rocks or, or earth. Whereas for instance, it's quite different. There's a, a different perspective. You have the creator, um, then you have the rocks, grandfathers, then the plants, then the animals, and then at the very bottom is man. So man is, is pretty humble. He, he relies on everything to survive. And to me, that's a big difference in, in how you view the, the world. Thank you, Rockford. I have another question that I, I want to ask you. And the next question is, how does uh, traditional knowledge affect modern teaching? Um, as you think about that for a second, how traditional knowledge affects modern teaching, I also want to uh, say hello to Lorianne Daniels uh, tuning in and Marjorie Dumont from uh, Squamish and uh, Territory, AKA Vancouver, BC. And uh, I also see uh, Pollyanne McBain from Fort McMurray Public School. This is wonderful to have uh, people tuning in from across uh, the country. So uh, Rockford, I'd ask you this question for a response is, how does traditional knowledge affect modern teaching? I think, uh, I think we gotta be uh, like our ancestors, we're much more practical in, in, in how we teach our, our uh, students, uh, much more hands-on. Um, we got to get away from just you know teaching out of a textbook. It, it has to be uh, really hands-on learning, um, relevant to where they live, and uh, that way it, it, it becomes much more interesting. Our, our students are, are are very curious about the world. It, it's uh, in the modern world, so you know they they want to learn about robotics and coding, physics and chemistry. So it, it's not just land-based education, it's, it's a wide variety of, of things they want to learn. 
Excellent. That, that ties into something I'm so passionate about, and that is land-based education. Uh, utilizing um, the, the environments around us to, to look at biology. Uh, just the other day, I was uh, sitting with my friend who teaches science at Tom Collegiate in Regina, Saskatchewan, and I was uh, notifying him about why don't our students know some of these things about evergreen trees, about pine trees, the biological understanding of trees uh, that, that Willie Irmine talks so very much about in our first uh, uh, online discussion forum. Um, Rockford, if I could ask you one more question is, uh, how does language affect modern teaching? Um, well, language it, it, in, in our communities, it, it, it depends, of course, where the communities are. Um, if it's a remote community, uh, they have their, their first language much more uh, closer to them than, uh, than, than uh, communities that have uh, road access. I, I find even communities that have the uh, the road access, English may not be uh, well developed. So um, there that there could be issues to, to learning. But uh, if, if if students have uh, an understanding of, of their their language, um, they have a, an opportunity to to learn. Um, much more and uh, in, in a world view that's uh, quite different. Thank you very much, Rockford. Our, our third panelist is uh, Badab Dobbin. And uh, Badabin, I know uh, language is uh, something that is very a passion of yours, something that is influential in the way you educate and the way you teach. I know that you're, uh, you've created indigenous.ca um, um, please share a little bit more about some of your work, and uh, um, I know you're the co like I said, the co-founder of Indigenize.ca. Um, you uh, educator of knowledge in plant-based medicines. Um, so please uh, share with us a little bit about that, and then I'd like to ask you the same question that I just asked Rockford about how does language um, impact teaching? Well, <clears throat> I'd like to start. Um, I guess where it all came from is the family and the community that I that I grew up in, and um, there's quite a few stories that I think about. Where uh, in my family, they always said uh, you got to think about the holistic of things, you know, the whole things and the the reper repercussions of things, and uh, think about the future for yourself, but also the impact of your decisions and. So I, uh, you know, some of what has already been said from Rockford and from Edward, I think, uh, you know, I, I could parallel or mirror some of those um, rational ways of thinking, uh, holistic ways of thinking, right? And um, yeah, so one thing that I saw where I am at down in Nogojonong or Peterborough was sometimes the lack of access to uh, our 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 language or to our sciences, you know, even to sometimes community based and the, the community way of teaching, uh, you know, where that love, kindness, care and gentle approach is important as well. And uh, sometimes within uh, Western education, you know, there's a, a lack of that uh, connection or that uh, that humanness Right when and a lot of times we talk about it, uh, we raise it up where we'll describe even my, uh, you know, some of my participation within colleges and university as higher education, and we're already disconnecting it from a human level, right? And so, uh, one rationale why me and my partner wanted to start Indigenize.ca is to reach our own family members and community members and. Uh, build some of that access for um, the ones who we're really working for as well or working to um, you know connect and so I think that's some of the rationale behind indigenize.ca and as well as some of the work at the colleges and university level for us is is to um, you know reach indigenous students within those institutions but as well as the students who will be working with our our future uh, use or our communities as well. And so uh, I wanted to try and have a reach, you know, as far as possible because 
uh, what I've been given in terms of knowledge and, and uh, what I've been exposed to in, in my own networks, uh, I want to enhance that other work that people have to offer as well. I'll leave it there. Jimmy Gwetch. Mirabin, I, I thank you very much for uh, that, that response. Also, in your background, uh, in, in your setting today, I, uh, you know, the forefront is these uh, medicines that are very important to, during this time. You know, I was even thinking about that understanding as I was driving here about, you know, when we're thinking about math and sciences, the medicines incorporates that as well at such a deep level. Um, uh, so I also want to encourage people who are listening today to uh, put questions into the comment but, and to also text. I'm, I'm sorry, this is a new time, or first time I've used, uh, I won't say uh, who makes this phone, but uh, please uh, send in your text so I can uh, ensure that I get them uh, for the next question. So for the next question, I'd like to, uh, to go to Ed. Um, and. I'd like to ask you about a question I heard from a, um, and I might misquote you, so please uh, uh, adjust my quote. Um, you had talked about how pure math has, has taken over mathematics, and um, I, I, I wanted to know what you meant a little bit by, by that, and um, could you please share um, that a little bit deeper? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, you know, I, I look at uh, math education at the university level is what I'm most familiar with, and, and I see that it's it's just sort of a, a, a giant stream that goes toward multivariable calculus. It's the kind of calculus that we might use as mathematicians, as physicists, as engineers. And, and then the rest of the math curriculum is just, is just really about, well, where do you fall off? You know, you can't make it to multivariable calculus, so you're going to fall off at some point. That seems to be the way that the whole thing is structured. And I think that that's not appropriate for most people. Most students, I think maybe 2% of our students, of, of students in general, want to become engineers, physicists, or mathematicians. And so we're only really serving 2% of our students. So I think we, uh, you know, we, we need to uh, look at recon reconstructing our entire mathematics program. So let me pick an example for you, uh, uh, long division. So uh, we teach students in long division, I uh, or sorry, long division in school. I learned that in grade four or grade five, uh, grade four. And then, um, you know, I asked myself, why do we learn that? Uh, uh, well, it's because we want to learn division of polynomials when we do algebra in high school. Well, well why do we want to learn division of polynomials when we do a division in high school? Well, it's because we need to do something called partial fractions in, in university calculus. Uh, but, you know, I think that if we dispense with that endpoint, then we can really ask ourselves these questions about all this process all the way through. Why on earth are we uh, learning this when there are so many other really, truly useful things, interesting things, practical things to learn? And so I would like to see us uh, reevaluate the entire math program from the point of view of uh, applications of what we might call applied math, although that too is a Western concept, but how do we apply mathematical knowledge to practical situations of interest to indigenous people? And then we might, you know, we might even leave it up to the students. What do you want to learn? What is going to help you with the problems that are important to you? Thank you for uh, sharing that, Ed. It, it's very insightful, you know, as, as uh, you know, this terminology that you're using with mathematics. And uh, when, you, when you say things like pure math, you know, it always brings me back to a conversation when I was teaching high school at uh, Belfort Collegiate. I sat with the late uh, George Favel, and he talked to me about how his teacher had many times talked to him about variables in mathematics. And he said, it took me a week to figure out what variables were, and it wasn't until she said, can you stay after class on Friday? And she gave him some money to go buy bread at the store and said, now let's talk about the variables that will come into, into play as, as you go by this bread at the store. So um, very real life e examples of that. <clears throat> if we could go back um, to Bitterman and talk about uh, how do in, in, in indigenous knowledges, how do indigenous uh, medicines, um, how would you incorporate knowledge of traditional medicines in science? I'd, I'd love to hear some more about mm. that, Bitterman. So I'll just say it one more yeah. time. How would you incorporate indigenous knowledge of traditional medicines and science? Yeah, I would like to. Uh, and I'll help you with my pronunciation, Bidavin. Thank you very much. Say it one yeah, more time. Yeah, that's okay. Bidavin. Bidavin. Yes, right on, perfect. Thank you. So, um, 
So there's a lot here back to that holistic science. So I think about one little story that my my grandpa used to say is uh, he uh, gave me this one random question. He said, you know why I'm, I am the way I am? And he said, you know why sometimes people are described as lazy, he would say. And uh, I didn't know why. I was a little kid and I said, I don't know. And he said, well, it's because the activities that I do and the things that I work with are high energy. The food that I eat, I have to outsmart, I have to be quick, I have to be diligent, I have to calculate how I'm going to uh, harvest that. He says, that's really, truly fast food, right? And so it reminds me of this about plant-based medicine or foods, that uh, it's all an equation as well. So what you see behind here, uh, there's, a, there's a calculated thing that we have to do for the sustainability to harvest and access these. You know, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable showing everyone this if I didn't know that uh, I've done as much possible that I could in uh, environmental sustainability, environmental ecological restoration to uh, enhance the life or the nationhood of these plants, right? And so anything that I take, I ensure that the next time I go visit, it's going to be tenfold. So I have to really take into account all of the environmental impacts or the environmental communication, the governing systems of an ecosystem. And then, so that's one part of how all the science could be broken down into uh, informing uh, an environmental uh, relationship, responsibility, reciprocity, or, you know, an active sustainability piece. There's one other little piece I want to say is, also interacting with the landscape, what I also see there, what we see as, you know, many people who interact with the landscape or medicines and plants, is they see the impact of the calculation of former generations and what they have done to the environment. You see that tickling or that, that impact of sustainability and uh, responsibility to the environment. So it's like another communication or another science communication that the ancestors have left their impact there, right? And then my other favorite thing, I like to imagine this and really try to see the unseen aspects of the chemicals and the formulas of all these volatile oils that are going into different recipes. And then we're applying sometimes heat, we're applying uh, variations of types of heat that were, were um, gaining access to specific volatile oil compounds and then we're metabolizing those things right so i think part of uh indigenous or Anishinaabe science takes into account what might be deemed as life knowledge or life science uh someone had said about science literacy you know indigenous languages not just put into a certain Anishinaabe literacy of uh, identity and worldview and health determinants and uh you know, family and responsibility, but also everything in terms of a calculated health literacy as well. So, uh, yeah, if you can kind of dissect all of those pieces, there's so much science and interpretation that that could fill in all of those blanks. And uh, we have different individuals who kind of take that understanding and say, we're going to look and dissect and look further into medicine or volatile oils and all that anyways i'll leave it there i could go on and on it is a passion of mine <laughs> <laughs> thank you for sh sharing that with us uh, one of the joys of, of being on a panel is we have multiple intellectual people thinking about the same things and think sometimes similar but also there's uh, pieces to add so i'd like to go to rockford with the same question rockford how would you incorporate knowledge of traditional medicines in science and math i'd love to hear some more from from your perspective um, well, traditional medicines, um, I'm, I'm really reminded of, of uh, when we uh, did the textbook and uh, of course we had uh, a section on, on Ask an Expert and that was always uh, a professor at a university and, and we had uh, Ask an Elder on the opposite side of the, the page. And I can specifically remember uh, one section that was on uh, traditional medicines and the other side was uh, a medical doctor 
And when I, I talked to the publishers about this, I said, when, when I look at this and I, I read between the lines here, I'm saying, well, what we're saying here is, is we're actually saying the, the elder is not an expert. He's something else. So if I'm a student, that's, that's what this textbook is showing. Why, why say ask the expert and the other side ask, ask the elder? And I, I really push them to, to try to change that. And, and, and it, it depends on, on the question, on, on who the expert is. So if it was on, uh, on medicines, you know, they're, 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 of course you, you have the, the modern pharmacology side and, and you have the traditional medicine side, but it, it depended on what the question was. So, for instance, if the question is about, uh, let's say, about curing a, a, let's say, a stomach ache, well, if the question is, where do you get your medicine, it, if, if you're up north somewhere, you may not have access to, uh, to the local pharmacy. Um, so... Who's the expert in, in, in this situation? It, it would be somebody with that traditional knowledge of, of uh, traditional medicine. So they're the expert in that case. Um, so here's the question. If, if, if we asked uh, a pharmacist where I could get uh, a medicine to cure that stomach ache and, and say a remote community as Red Sucker Lake, and if there's no pharmacy store, what can that person do? In, in this case, that, that pharmacy guy is not an expert. He, 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 he can't help, whereas a, an elder can. So it, I would consider that person an expert then. So that was a, a real issue in, in that uh, publication. Thank you, Rockford. Uh, you know, Kameo Capo, I see earlier in the comments, made a, uh, a wonderful comment about uh, getting the opportunity to sit down and, and listen to uh, uh, people leading uh, Indigenous academia in math and science. Um, I also want to acknowledge that uh, as the individuals who sit here, we sit with all the people that we've sat with, the elders, the knowledge keepers, um, life, the interaction with uh, the four-legged, crawling, and, and winged ones. Um, you know, we carry, we sit with that knowledge, um, you know, uh, such a interesting conversation that you have uh, going forward, Rockford. I'd like to turn my attention over to uh, Dr. Edward Doolittle. Now, Edward, I know that um, your your wife is a, is a teacher. She, in fact, uh, just fin uh, finished recently through the Indigenous Education at First Nations University, so I'm sure that teaching in mathematics in, in high school is a quintessential question uh, discussion in the household. So Wendy Lee uh, Morrison Pym asked the question, what about current trends in math towards problem-solving mathematics that in some classrooms is failing students, especially Indigenous ones, who are absorbing information rather than testing it? Well, um, well, uh, just to talk a little bit about my wife, she's uh, she's actually teaching grade one. So she went through uh, your program to learn to teach uh, uh, high school English, but the job that she got uh, on her reserve was teaching grade one students, and so that's how she figured she could uh, serve her community, and now she's working in Saskatoon uh, teaching Cree immersion there. So uh, language is, is very important to her, to both of us. Uh, but um, it's a little different math that the high school level than it is at the uh, at the grade school level but you know I, I think there are some uh, developments in modern education modern mathematics education that I see as positive and what I really think about this you know maybe I don't know you'll have to you know professional educators will have to evaluate the statement but uh, my belief is that in many cases they are taking up methods that have been used by indigenous people for a long time and you know that is becoming uh, more used in modern education, uh, and so you know looking at uh, project problems, 
uh, and group work, working together. Those are examples of ways that education and mathematics is changing, the way, ways that are, it's looking more like traditional education. And I see those as positives. In some cases, it hasn't worked out very well, I'll admit. Uh, and, and that, I think, is because uh, teachers are not given proper uh, training, education in these new methods. They've just been introduced by governments, but not being supported by governments. So I really I call on our governments to uh, alter, to improve the way that math, uh, mathematics teachers are trained and educated. Thank you for that, Ed. I also want to uh, point out Clarissa Delorme from Chief Kakuishtahao Community School. I thank you for your continued support, and as always, in education. Um, I'm going to go uh, uh, back to you, Ed, and I'm going to pull out my eight fingers here because I have a question. Um, <laughs> why are there eight aspects to Indigenous mathematics? And I will slowly count them down on my fingers as you go through each one of the eight. Oh, well, <laughs> gosh, yeah. Now you're going to put me on the spot here. I, I did give a talk. Uh, it's, on, it's online through the University of Winnipeg. And, and I, I chose eight just because it's, uh, it, it fits around the circle very nicely. That's all. I mean, you can, you can invent more. You can, you can say that there are fewer. I tried to interleave uh, kind of practical with, uh, with theoretical ideas. And so that divides it in two. So eight is nice because it divides by two and then divides by two two again and divides by two again. So you, you have dichotomies, which are very common in, in Mohawk culture. You think of uh, you know, the two sides of a coin. So there's a lot of twos, and then two twos makes four, and then two fours makes eight. So that's why I chose eight. I think it's a, a good number for us to, to help us remember, although I'm short-circuiting on all the memory stuff right now. But uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's in some sense it's arbitrary, but in other sense it's very helpful. And this is this is an aspect of indigenous education uh, that. Um, you know, indigenous thought has been uh, oral, orally transmitted for uh, millennia, for since time immemorial, and so uh, we have ways of organizing knowledge in oral ways. Uh, so, you know, for example, uh, a lot of our knowledge, uh, Mohawk knowledge, is stored in the Hundungale uh, Wadekwan, uh, which is the words that come before all else. It's, it's sort of like an opening uh, address, a Thanksgiving address is sometimes called. And, and, it's, and it's structured, it's ordered, it's ordered from the ground up. So we, we talk about our mother of the earth and the waters on the earth and the fish in the waters and so on. And this helps us to remember it when we deliver it, to remember uh, you know, that uh, we, we go through the sequence and then we don't forget things, we don't leave things out. And so, um, you know, when, when knowledge is structured that way, when, when we have to carry it around in our minds, we have to put structures on it, like here's eight, here's four. Uh, and, and I try to follow that. I try to follow that method. I try to work without notes. When I teach, I don't use notes. I just use what's in my mind. And, and I encourage, you know, our Indigenous educators to do the same. That that way will bring us back to our traditions, I think. Thank you for that response, Ed. You know, uh, I, I like your advice there at the end to uh, take forth the knowledges that, that's within us already, not to make any uh, notes. Although I think some of my students would be worried about me. I'm such a wild card at times of <laughs> what I could say or go with. But um, I want to finish up with uh, Badabin and um, ask him, what is a success for you as an educator? So. Uh, what, you know, how would you determine that? How would you uh, define that? What is success for you as an educator? Well, um, I would think one of the things I think about is the try to really envision ahead and uh, trying to look at what our ancestors kind of envisioned for us, but what they also envisioned for for ahead. And so I think about our current state in our generation, even though I'm a little bit on the older side of this generation, yeah. not the very old side, but uh, you know that on everyone's mind on, on a lot of the youth heart is climate crisis. So one of my successes that I think is to try and inspire some critical thinking on the solutions that can go into a climate crisis, right? And trying to challenge this idea that as humans, we are the problem. Right, and that's sort of a fantasy that Western science kind of promotes this idea of a, um, you know, a self-maximizing a little bit human as the weak link within the web. But when you look at a term like ake or akana ode, you know, it, it places this intrinsic web of responsibility and governing systems. So 
I like to tell young people and students to say, we have an important responsibility to be healthy, to survive, that we're in an intrinsic web of relationship and responsibility that traditional knowledge can be a supporting factor to working towards uh, beginning to balance our impact on creation, that we aren't truly self-maximizing by nature, but rather that we could, uh, you know, see some hope within our impact on the environment, on species, on uh, creation and say, we can, we can do a lot as individuals or as collectives, as families, as communities, when we begin to activate our responsibility to creation, right? And so that's what I like to inspire and what I would consider uh, what I start to see some of the excess, success of what students are beginning to develop uh, and plan for action in their own lives. And, uh, you know, sometimes it might be plant-based medicine and the other work that other plant knowledge holders are doing, like the example, uh, you know, a shout out to Joseph Pekwanika in Creator's Garden and some of his passion for uh, plant-based medicine and uh, res exercising that responsibility to creation. I'll leave it there. Jimmy Glitch. Miigwech, uh, Badabin. I, uh, I thank you for, for bringing that forward. You know, uh, it's so wonderful to talk about how, what, what are the de determining factors of success? You know, how do we determine, how do we look at that? What, what does it include? And, and I, I like how you talk about, you know, um, essential pieces of their life moving forward with, outside of just seeing education as a, a moment in, in our lives, but it's, it's ongoing. So thank you very much. Uh, I'd now like to go to Rockford with the same question to wrap up with him. Uh, Rockford, what is success for you as an educator? I, I think when we, uh impact a, a student's life and, and, and change their life. Um, I can remember uh, having a, a group of young guys and at, at the school they were kind of identified as, as the, uh, the bad guys of the school and a, a lot of teachers didn't uh, want too much to do with them and when when I came along and uh, as a uh, consultant for uh, for our school division, I uh, I thought about what are the things that that I really enjoyed about about learning, and uh, I saw that there was this uh, competition about uh, building an RC hovercraft, and and I thought, you know what, I'm I'm going to get these guys to to learn how to make this uh, RC hovercraft, and they had to learn about electronics, uh, batteries, radio. Uh, soldering and, and design and, and not only that but it, it had to be a, a business plan too and I, I spent time with them about uh, teaching about RC um, equipment and, and robotics and, and there, there was a, a, a school competition taking place it was a, a volleyball tournament and and these guys had uh, pretty much finished their their hovercraft and uh, it was coming close to the uh, competition time, and uh, unfortunately, one of the visiting teams had uh, broke into the uh, the science area, and they ripped apart this this hovercraft. And uh, I got a call late one night, just the, the following night, and uh, the teacher was in a, a real panic, and and she said that uh, what had happened that this hovercraft was was destroyed. And I, I looked at my calendar and I said, well, I, I can only come out. The only opening I have is, is next week and would be the earliest. And so we made plans for, for, for me to visit again. And the next day I, uh, I got another phone call and, and, and she told me that uh, the boys had uh, repaired the hovercraft and uh, made it even better. So I, I knew at that point that... Uh, I had uh, made an impact on their lives and, and uh, ignited a passion in them. And uh, that's what uh, really defines success to me in education is, is igniting a passion in our students. Thank you, Rockford. I'd like to thank our, our first two call-in guests on the panel. Uh, 
uh, Bedabin and also Rockford. I appreciate uh, you know the, the sharing that you you gave for us. There's such a wide variety of uh, knowledge throughout the questions that we have. We're going to take a quick break here. Um, if you could please click on the like and share button to help our community grow. Keep hitting that like button. Keep hitting that share button. We would greatly appreciate it. Stay tuned, and we'll be right back with uh, final comments and final words from uh, Dr. Will Yermine. Thank you very much. I see some comments coming up online, and, and don't worry, Willie uh, Ermine is coming up. Um, we want to ask Ed a couple of questions quickly before we uh, have uh, Willie on the line. So please stay tuned for uh, Willie Ermine. But before we go there, I'd, I'd like to ask Ed the following question. What has the experience been like for you going through the stories and finding mathematics in them? Where is the culture of Indigenous mathematics at? Well, that's a great question. It's a it's a lifelong journey for me. You know, it's something I started when I was 18, and uh, now I'm in my 50s, and I'm still working on it. Uh, I, I'm very anxious to find indigenous mathematics, and the harder I look, the more I find. So, uh, for example, uh, creation stories. You know, uh, we look for thing, uh, try to find where they're placed in Mohawk culture, things, knowledge that's. Um, uh, fundamental and unchanging, you'll often find in the creation story knowledge that's gained and acquired over time. Uh, it, you'll find in our uh, Thanksgiving address, uh, just two examples of where knowledge is stored. But we look at the creation story, you'll find that uh, introductory mathematics is in the creation story. There's a number of words and number of ideas uh, are encoded in the story. In fact, uh, they work back and forth. So uh, the numbering helps us to remember the order of the story and uh, and the order of the story helps us to teach numbering to children. So that's just one example. I mean, there must be hundreds. Uh, you know, I, I could go on and on, but I, you know, I would just encourage everyone to look for these things. And the more of us that look for them, the more we'll find them. Uh, the one thing that I caution uh, uh, about is that uh, you know, these things are not uh, considered a separate form of knowledge in indigenous culture, that they're integrated with everything. Uh, so we didn't have mathematics in the sense of being distinct from science, distinct from cosmology and so on. These, these were all integrated together. So uh, it is a bit, um, you know, we are imposing a bit of a Western lens when we start to pull them apart. But on the other hand, we have to work with the world as it is. Uh, and to me, success in education is, is about giving students options. You know, we don't know what kind of world that they're going to live in in the future. We don't know what the climate's going to be like. We don't know what 
know what our diseases are going to be like, and uh, we don't know what economics is going to be like. So uh, we, I think, are succeeding, and we are being responsible educators if we are giving options to students and not uh, telling them that we know what's best for them. So uh, one more question, Ed, because I know you've been doing a lot of uh, research. One of the wonderful things about our occupation is we get to teach, but then we get to go and work with communities and en engage with research. How is your research on mathematics in residential schools going? That's just at its beginning stage, but I think it's going to be a fruitful endeavor. So I just wrote an article for the um, for the uh, Canadian Math Society notes, CMS notes. It's online. Uh, it's talking about mathematics and reconciliation. And one of the issues that I pointed out is that something that hasn't been studied very much, uh, or at all even, that I know of, is uh, mathematics in residential school. So very few things were taught in residential school. We know students who went through it learned uh, manual labor. They learned the language. And we know what language is for, languages uh, to replace their indigenous language. We also learned about religious studies, and that was to replace indigenous spirituality. And finally, they learned mathematics. And that's just about it. What was the purpose of teaching mathematics in residential school? What mathematics was taught? Uh, I think that there, there's some uh, you know, major questions there. I, um, I, I'm raising the question. I'm not necessarily the best equipped. You know, my, my education is as a pure mathematician, but I am interested in collaborating with, uh, with math educators, researchers in math education to take a hard look at mathematics in residential school. Uh, I'm also collaborating with, a, with an elder, uh, Linda Young in, in Saskatoon, uh, who is talking to me about her experiences. And so I think together we're going to write a paper about that. So that's where I'm at with that. Thank you. Uh, be before I, uh, I switch over to Willie here, though, uh, Ed, I'd, I'd, I know we're, we're staying home and we're playing a lot of board games. And, and so quickly, in a, in a short description, can you tell us a little bit about Cree Scrabble that you've uh, created? Yeah, sure. Uh, happy to. It's called Scrabble. And uh, it's, it's uh, you know, I had the idea, what uh, what would a Cree, Cree games look like, Cree puzzles, Cree word puzzles look like? And I've, I'm working on a whole bunch of them. I'm working on word searches. I'm working on crossword puzzles. But there's also games, uh, which are not just single-person puzzles, but uh, but where two people play against each other, which could be potentially more fun. Uh, Scrabble is one that I'm familiar with in English. I thought, what is going to take to translate this into, into Cree? And so I've been working with Eric Wolvengray to get the frequencies of letters, to get the scoring. Uh, we're using a big Super Scrabble set, which is 21 wide, because Cree words are much longer than English words. And we're changing the rules. We're still tinkering with it, but very soon I'm, I'll be ready to publish this thing on, on my website. Uh, everyone will be able to download it. And what, I, what I've done right now is to uh, uh, do a trial run. I got the tiles laser cut and laser burned. So uh, it's, a, it's a simple manufacturing process. I got bags of tiles, and uh, we, we play tested them. So Eric Wolvengray has played with his wife, uh, Gino Kamasis. They're both very fluent and uh, literate in Cree, and uh, they had a great time playing it. In fact, it was hard for me to get the tiles back from Eric. So. <laughs> no. Excellent. You know, and I look, I look forward. Maybe I might have to come time to uh, dust off some of my Cree skills, some of my Cree wording. There we go. So um, I know there's been some comments about how do I get a hold of some of these panelists. I want you to know that every one of these panelists are contributors on the NCCIE website, and their contact information is also available there. So please go to the nccie.ca website and look for their contact information. And all the panelists today can be contacted through the, those sites. <clears throat> I'd now like to take our time to uh, go towards Willie Ermine. Uh, Willie Ermine is a, is a close friend of mine. He's a mentor. He's a guide. Um, I met him about four years ago, and I had said to him, Willie, we're not done yet at the conclusion of our culture camp. He is continually um, influencing such an influential person in education, in life, in indigeneity. Um, it's so wonderful whenever I get to see your face. I know you weren't able to come down from Sturgeon Lake today to be with us in the studio. I miss you dearly, but I'm happy to see that you are doing wonderful. Um, so Willie Ermine has been an integral part to NCCIE in both the guidance and the um, information that he provides for us. Um, I could go on for another hour about how wonderful this man is. So thank you very much for joining us today, Willie. Uh, Tanse, I guess I should say, Anin. And uh, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, open it up with final thoughts. I know you've been listening. I have some questions for you, but uh, maybe some initial final thoughts as, uh, as you've been listening to our discussion. 
So we're having a little bit of connection issues right now uh, with Willie. Um, this is one of the things that we face when we're trying to do in studio. Uh, Willie is uh, residing right now on uh, Sturgeon Lake First Nations, uh, about 20 miles northwest of Prince Albert, and we're uh, we're, we're trying to make uh, do with with the. Uh, things that we have at this moment. So I apologize, we went away from Willie there at this time because uh, we need to ensure that uh, you can hear. I, I know that the, the feed was distorted, so uh, I'm such a knowledgeable man, I, I know we uh, we will uh, lose that benefit of, of hearing what he has to say. So. Um, We're just going to try cue it up one last one last time here and uh, see if we, we can get back on to uh, time with Willie. So uh, as they're trying to get to get that going up, Ed, I'm sure you heard in the background. You know, we want to hear more about this Cree uh, uh, Scrabble that's going that's going on. You know, yeah, we want to sure. hear about the syllabics. We want to hear about all the aspects of it. We want to know the highs and the lows of it all. So please share with us. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, uh, what we're using is a standard Roman orthography uh, SRO instead of syllabics. Uh, I thought about syllabics. Uh, there are some issues, though. There are so many syllabic characters that, you know, uh, it would be hard to make a reasonable distribution. If we included at least one, then we'd use up, uh, you know, half of our 200 Scrabble tiles. So uh, we, we decided to go with uh, standard Roman orthography. Uh, and, and uh, you know, what, what uh, is in the background here is that uh, uh, we're, we're looking at a kind of a unified spelling system for Cree. So uh, Eric Wolvengray has produced uh, dictionaries uh, uh, which have uh, you know a, a consistent uh, spelling system and and that's one of the things about Scrabble is that you uh, you're kind of bound to a specific dictionary if you're really going to play it uh, so so you know there, there's a few issues uh, now we we went through lists of words to get frequencies how often does each letter appear uh, and this is one of the big problems in the design of it. Uh, so in, in, uh, in English version of Scrabble, the people who invented Scrabble actually took the letter frequencies from the front page of the New York Times. And they got uh, natural frequencies of letters. Uh, we don't have a corpus like that of written Cree. Uh, or not at least a readily available one, not a digital one. So instead of uh, uh, using a digital corpus, we use a dictionary. And the distribution of letters in a dictionary is going to be different from the distribution of letters in, in a straight, ordinary written language. And poetry might be different from prose, and uh, reporting might be different from fiction, and so on. So uh, what, one, one thing I would really like to do is to get my hands on a, a, a body, a significant body of written Cree, and maybe we'll get a more natural distribution but in the meantime we're making do with what we've got uh, and um, you know we, we've got to play test it so uh, uh, once I you know I, I got a few things I got to tune up I'm gonna put this thing and make it available some people I see are asking about the website uh, uh, I am not sure which website I don't have one but certainly there'll be a link through the First Nations University site so I have a page on First Nations University I'll link to wherever I put the, the scribble sets Thank you for sharing a little bit more about that, Ed. Uh, Rachel White, you bring up an, an important uh, point. The connectivity on many reserves is very slow. You know, it takes me back to remind, it reminds me about my uh, nephew, uh, Ference Francis, as he was telling me about how um, how was life when he had moved back to the reserve, and he said it's a little tough. The the uh, internet connection is slow, and it affects my gaming. And I said, well, life is pretty good if we just have to worry about internet connection, my boy. So. Um, 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 we're, we're still trying to get uh, Willie in, included into this call. Um, Kameo, you, Kapo, you bring up another great uh, resource, uh, Audrey Drever, um, another... Um, okay, we're, we're ready for Willie to, to come in. So, Willie, hello, welcome back. Hi, Dustin. <laughs> and it, this is quite an experience, uh, <laughs> the technology and all that. Uh, but greetings to you, Dustin, Edward, Ida, Bun, and Rockford, and all your listeners as well. So greetings to all of you. Can you hear me? 
hear me? Can you hear me, Willie? Yes. 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 So, can, so can, can I get you, can to, I get some, you to give some final thoughts, some, some thoughts that you, uh, for around today's discussion around math and science, Indigenous perspectives and ways of uh, looking at math and science? Uh, unfortunately, I didn't, I didn't catch very much of the discussion I, you had. Uh, I was going in and out and trying to resolve this uh, technical thing. Uh, but what I, I did catch, um, and it, it, it's it's uh, you know we're trying to reconcile two worldviews uh, is my initial thought about it all. It, it it's trying to reconcile how how do we how do we bring in both perspectives in, into this idea, and 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 there are different approaches of course uh, the worldview informs our approach how we're going to understand mathematics science and everything like that. It's not as if that uh, uh, math and science have been captured by the Western world, that they are the only ones with these uh, uh, disciplines and understandings. Um, it, it, and again, I think Rockford mentioned it, it depends how, what, what perspective, what lenses we use to try to understand these. I can, I can look from my own perspective and talk about the science that we have. and. Um, I, I, I think uh, Western Western scientists would have a hard time understanding that as well. So uh, the other thing I, I just wanted to mention, and I caught glimpses of it in, in the discussion in, in some ways, was this idea that uh, science is uh, uh, strictly a, a, a very mathematical, Western-oriented way of reading the world, um, that science is the only... The scientific Western scientific methodology is the only way that uh, uh, you know the whole process can unfold in terms of understanding science. Um, but I think what um, what what is missing, and when we when we talk about our our worldview, um, one thing that is essential in that worldview. Uh, to use as a lens is this idea of uh, our our own our own metaphysical reality, our our spiritual reality, and and so spirituality does not uh, it, it, it does not become removed in in particular subjects or or any ideas that we talk about. Uh, science uh, spirituality is not removable. We'll, we'll put it that way. So no matter what the topic is, no matter what we're talking about, um, it has elements of, of spirituality to it. And, and that's the element that uh, when we think about math and we think about science, that how do we include spirituality into these, uh, into these disciplines and understandings? Um, and if, if, if I can be so bold to say as well, that there is a science to spirituality. Um, there's a certain process that we follow to understand spirituality. It's got its own data, it's got its own methodology to understand. Um, so it, there is a, um, a science to it. Um, and it, we should be able to replicate certain processes or findings or um, in in spirituality as well. So there is a science to it. There's a there's a way we do it, and it's this understanding that does not enter the discourse in this Western perspective of. Uh, So just those two points for now, Dustin. Okay, okay. Th thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, Willie. Willie, can I get you to, um, is it possible to turn down your computer volume or mute your computer volume? I feel like I should pick up the phone like we're having a, a phone conversation here. I, I really like this. It's, uh, <laughs> I, um, I'm so glad that you could, could join us into this discussion. So um, I'd like to ask you one more question here for sure, Willie. Um, such such uh, you know, like you said, spirituality and science, that connection that, that is there. But also, how does language affect teaching? 
how does language affect teaching when we're thinking about math and science? Well, it's it's the same idea. Uh, language is is infused infused with uh, spirituality, the spiritual language, uh, the understandings that go with uh, uh, sound. For example, I guess we can study sound. If we study sound, we would find that you know there is a science to it, but it also from our indigenous perspective, sound has uh, also is. Um, is a way to to not only understand the world but also to um, uh, to make sound to the world. Uh, if I can give you an example, when we say uh, the Cree word for prayer is kakisimo, that's the Cree word for prayer. Kakisimo. What that the root words of that word uh, of that word kisik is in there, which is the universe. It, it's the whole universe. However, you perceive the universe, and mo the m o at the end is 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 the sound. You know, so we make a sound to the universe when when we do our prayers. So there there is a, you know language has. A, uh, an impact in the world, uh, the sound of language. I asked an elder one time, you know, where do we get our language? And the response was, and I didn't understand it at that time, and I'm not saying I understand it now, but here's the response that he gave me. You know, uh, he said, our language comes from nature. It's It comes from the wind blowing. It comes from the the birds chirping, it, it comes from the, the grass, you know, flowing in the, in the breeze. It, it, it comes from different animals, uh, the growl of a bear or the, uh, the snort of a buffalo. It, it, what basically he said, is our sound comes from nature. We studied that sound, we studied the behavior of how that sound was used in that in that behavior. For example, he said we learn prayer from watching birds in the early in the morning. They get up real early in the morning and they talk to the young ones that very early period in the morning. And that's where we took language from and that's where we learn how to associate language and behavior that these two things are inseparable. So sound is, um, you know, um, it, 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 it might not be in itself a discipline at, uh, in the academic circles, but if we were to create our own disciplines uh, from the indigenous perspective, we, we would have, I think, uh, um, a sound discipline. That sound, and, and, and language is a part of that. Language is, you know, is a part of that. Drumming is a part of that. Singing is a part of that. Uh, walking on the land is a part of that. And you know, we're thumping our feet on the ground. Uh, sound just pervades our whole, whole existence. And, and, and these are the things that uh, culturalists or spiritualists or people studying culture will will delve into. You know, they're led into these areas to study these areas of sound. And, um, and, and you could include the mathematics of sound. For example, we did a booklet, uh, a Cree booklet, uh, translating all these words like addition, subtraction, multiplication, and all that. And I'm sure Edward will be aware of that book, um, where we atta- we 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 translated uh, the English words for addition, for example, into Cree. And it's not only a translation, but we also look at the. Um, uh, what what action and what behavior or what sound is associated with that? So you can actually perform um, a maneuver or behavior or sound in in real life. You know to to um, to do 
uh, addition, you know, to demonstrate addition. And and that, and so that switched over uh, mathematics from a purely academic point to one where we actually can perform these actions in in our behaviors. You know, we 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 do additions every day in in our behaviors and the way we move around. Are you still there? Yeah, yes, I am. Yes, I am. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Wonderful, wonderful, Willie. So there. Um, a blurb on that. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Willie. You know, uh, you, you panelists are reminding me of stories in my life. You know, uh, I had once uh, heard from one of the elders that I, I uh, go see often about how the raven had brought us our language. And, and I was telling my brother, Joe Putra, about that when we were out hunting. And, and he sometimes thinks I'm off in a far off land. And, and I said that a raven has the opportunity to mimic sounds of, of the, those things that are around him to share those, those sounds. And as we were walking through the bush, he was certain that he heard an elk. And he said, that's ah, just over there and I could see that raven in the distance making the call itself so um, yes uh, these uh, these animals too we do get our, our language from the environment from the animals from from those and, and my brother ended up looking like Elmer Fudd looking for uh, Bugs Bunny as uh, the, the raven was calling like an elk from the top of the trees so uh, I, I thank you for uh, sharing that Willie and uh, I'd like to just ask any final thoughts before um, before we conclude this from you Willie <laughs> Dustin, I have many thoughts. Uh, um, it's. It, w I think we're just entering the this world of uh, <clears throat> starting to uh, not necessarily penetrate the Western world of science and mathematics. You know, that's not. I don't think it's really our intent to, you know, to elbow our way in there and then uh, expose our espouse our um, our views and perspectives uh, but the point I think I want to make is that um, we have our our own perspectives our own ways of understanding and and our teachers are not um, necessarily visible like you would in academia you know um, giving us their knowledge feeding us their knowledge uh, if we want to really study our perspectives, our knowledge of science and mathematics, we have to go back to the land and start listening to those trees as, or listening to that wind and listening to the birds. And um, we, we, need, we, need, we need to develop our own understandings and our teachers is out on the land like that elder had reminded me of. Our teachers are uh, much, you know, they're very, they're very, they have a lot to 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 teach us. Uh, but it's us that we have to realign our learning learning processes. We have to re realign our thinking, you know, to be able to pick up this knowledge that is. Uh, it's everywhere. It's out on the land, and and that's my belief. And I and I think I see, not it's not only a belief in my head, but it's 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 things that, uh, you know, the things I talk about. I want to make sure that these things are happening, and that I'm not deceiving people. To you know, by telling them, go on the land if you want to learn about mathematics or science. You know, I I have to in my own way also be sure that what I say is how it is, you know, I am, um, it, it's this old scientific method again, how we experiment, how, you know, what, the, what kind of data we collect and how, how we can replicate certain processes, you know, it, a lot of our knowledge follows those same principles, maybe more rigorously, you know, with more rigor. And, and and certainly with more oomph to them, you know, if if you add a spiritual dimension to everything, so it's it's a lot of work, and 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 we need people out there that are going to do this work because, um, you know, it, it it's a richness that we have. I always say our people are so rich; we have not even really, you know, sunk our fingers fingers into this. Uh, the treasures that we have about our 
our people and, and what we have in our language, in our in our science, in our understanding of land, the understanding of nature and all that, everything, it, we are so rich yet, um, you know, that that's what we have to build up uh, and not, not try to fit, fit our concepts into Western mathematical models or scientific models. We have to, you know, ass, uh, you know, assert our own. We have to assert our own, study our own, assert our own, because that's what's required now, not not another tinkering of Western mathematics so that we can understand it. No, that's that's not what what is required. Thank you so much, Willie. I always appreciate whenever I get the opportunity to uh, to talk with you. And as I always tell you, we're not done yet, you and I. we got many more things that we have to complete in this world. And it's wonderful that we spoke in January trying to set up some dates that we could connect. And uh, every every date that we put out there, you and I were busy for something. So I know we're, we're both busy people doing great work. And I look forward to the next opportunity that we get to share and uh, continue doing the great work that we are doing. So thank you so much, Willie, for joining us today. I'm so glad technology worked to bring you in. I also want to, I know that uh, Willie talked about a mathematics book and uh, our national lead, Jennifer Dockstader, had posted on the, the comments that uh, Dr. Arzu, and she had uh, uh, presented his email address, contact him through that email address if you were interested in that mathematics book that uh, uh, Willie Ermine, uh, Dr. Arzu, and uh, Dr. Ida Swan created. So I want to thank everybody who uh, joined our online discussion forum today. I, if you could please hit the like button and share to help the conversation grow. Please send us your comments through uh, and your thoughts for future episodes and future online discussion forums. I want to send out my deepest thank you to Bitterman Pelche, uh, Rockford McKay, Edward Doolittle, and Willie Ermine. Also to uh, uh, Terry Massey for making this a, a brainchild of his and see, seeing this through. Thank you to all the people who text. I just got another text, so thank you to all those people who sent in their text and comments. Thank you to the IKS uh, Media and Technology Studio for uh, their wonderful handling of, it, of this online discussion forum. And of course, thank you to my bosses, uh, Interim President Dr. Bob Casius and uh, Vice President uh, Dr. Bettina Schneider. And thank you very much for the opportunity, Bonnie Rock Thunder, for allowing me to be the regional lead for Saskatchewan for NCCIE. So I thank you for everything that uh, that has, that has transpired as of this moment during the project. I also am happy to do our second online discussion forum. And please send us your comments and thoughts about future episodes of the show, and we will look forward to doing them next time. During this time, I'd ask you to stay safe, stay well, and we look forward to the next time that we're in collecting and gathering in spaces that we can be with each other again. Thank you very much. Miigwech. I hope.